what I've not come here to do. I've not come here to be like Paul Revere and tell you that global warming is coming. I've not come to scare you or shock you into action. Uh, right? We've tried that. It doesn't really work. Uh, a psychologist can tell you about these different frames, sort of Armageddon versus Nirvana, right? And if I shock you into an Armageddon frame, you can't think solutions, right? You can't think. You have to be in a Nirvana frame to think about a world where we don't use coal, right? That's a Nirvana frame. An Armageddon frame makes you want to go out and, uh, you know, drive a Hummer and, you know, throw beer cans out your window as you drive and drink along. Um, think about it, right? Think about the news you get every day. Like, I, I, I can do my own summary of it. We're in a deep recession as a global, global super credit bubble continues to collapse. China is retaking its role as a dominant world power. Ooh. The title it has claimed 15 of the last 18 centuries. That's true. Do you know that? Yeah. Our country is in a foul mood, seemingly aggressive, rooted as these things typically, typically are in insecurity. We're spread thin globally. Our great scam of printing endless supplies of money that gets sponged up globally because of the reserve currency status, that's complicated, of the dollar is quickly changing. Someday we may be just like Argentina, right? Great. But really, so what? You know? So little of that is irrelevant for what we can do, right? How about if we focus on the science of climate change? We can feel the same way. Record temperature increases, spreading diseases, increasingly severe storms, melting glaciers, rising seas. How about the acidifying seas, right? Corals can't even build anymore. Five more minutes of that and I will have you all in a deep funk, right? Come to think of it, our environmental movement is in a deep funk. Not that I haven't done that stuff myself, okay? So the answer is not to ignore the science. It's real, it's shocking, and it's deeply humbling. So it's more about what we do with this knowledge. My story is about why I've engaged this fight to stop global warming for almost 20 years, and what has motivated and inspired me. It's, it's about how I came to think of myself ultimately as a, as a happy warrior in this fight to stop global warming. So if I can get you to share some of my enthusiasm, um, then you'll port some of you will put your hearts and creativity into finding solutions for another 50 years. Because we've always known this is a long, long, long struggle. So it's not about, can I solve this in the next six months? All right? I have a cousin who keeps me really humble. Every time I see him at Christmas, he goes, John, did you work on global warming all year again? I said, yeah. He goes, is it? It has the science on it. Is it worse? I said, yeah, it's definitely worse for it. He goes, you should be fired. He does this to me every year. I can count on it. Christmas Day, I'm going to see Fred. He's going to do that to me. He keeps me humble. So the happy warrior thing, right? It's a different way of looking at it. Where does it start? It starts with a sense of wonder, not with science, not with policy. <coughs> you can also call this love. You can call it joy. To be an environmental activist is the first to be an ecologist is to understand the interconnections of our world and to notice them, <coughs> to see them in the world around us. It's not enough to know it from books, unless for dinner tonight, instead of eating, you would have been satisfied with a splendid essay on your favorite dishes. No, we're ecologists. So what does that mean? Ecologists pay attention, and that's not just by reading the latest science. Aldo Leopold, right, he's a great Forest Service employee who wrote um, an amazing essay called Thinking Like a Mountain. What was that? It's the ultimate ecological treatise is Thinking Like a Mountain. So where did it come from? It worked for the Forest Service. Forest Service viewed its job on Forest Service lands in times, at, at the time as uh, helping there be more deer. So hunters would be more happy, right? Taxpayers pay to hunt, they want to hunt deer. So how do you have more deer? You shoot the wolves, right? Fewer wolves, more deer, everybody's happy. Aldo Leopold was out there doing his duty. He was a big outdoorsman, and he's hunting. And so they open fire on this little stream as a family of wolves are moving through. And they take out the cubs, and then he shoots the mother. And then he's, the, the mother, he says, looks at him with this, like, killer stare, right? And he says he watches this bright green fire <coughs> drain from her eyes. Right? So what happened? In that moment, he, he said he thought like a mountain. So what that wolf did to him, it imparted some knowledge to him. It's like a mytho mythological thing. He thought like the mountain, which meant 
What does the mountain want? The hunters want more deer. The mountain wants things in balance. It needs enough wolves to keep the deer in check. Because if the deer aren't in check, the deer will, 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 will nibble down all the growth on the mountain. And the mountain will erode at an excessive rate, driving its silt into the stream, covering the small pebbles where the mayflies and caddisflies need to lay their eggs. So you won't have the trout. So you won't have the raptors. So that's thinking like a mountain. Right? It's sort of science. Right? But it's something different. Right? Rachel Carson, who wrote Silent Spring, really kicked off the modern environmental movement. She did this same thing while exploring the tide pools of Maine. So as a little kid, she was walked around by a woman she called Auntie, would hold her hands. She would explore the sea anemones and these little tide pools, all the critters in the little tide pools of Maine. And so she had gotten away from that. And when she was a sophomore in college, uh, she, was taking, uh, she wanted to be uh, an English major. So she was uh, taking English classes, and she had an obligatory biology class she had to take. And she said that the teacher reawakened the sense of wonder in her. Right? So I mean, she really was the greatest modern, the greatest environmentalist of the last several hundred years. But it goes back to a sense of wonder. Right? Ed Abbey found the same things in the Red Rock Deserts of Utah, John Muir in the High Sierras. You know the story of John Muir? I mean, how much did he want to feel it? He wrote an essay about seeing a storm approaching the High Sierras, climbing 80 feet high into a tall pine and lashing himself to it because he wanted to feel the full fury of that storm. Right? Kind of nuts, right? <laughs> kind of nuts. But it gets at a point about feeling this stuff in a different way. And as a result, he could feel and sense things. He made discoveries about how glaciers work and how erosion works and how, what happens in, in geology that, that scientists later proved to be true. Lois Gibbs, um, she, she was one of the great activists of the last 20 years. Um, where did it come to from her? It came from her love for her children. Her children were sick and she realized her whole community was built, built on a, a former dump from, uh, at Love Canal. Right? And then that made her, once she realized that this stuff was making her children sick, she is the fiercest activist I've really ever known. Right? Though to this day, there are uh, New York uh, State Department of Environmental Protection employees who claim that Lois held, them host Lois held them hostage. And Lois said, I didn't hold them hostage. It's just that all our people were around their building. <laughs> they said, we were afraid to leave. And she said, they should have been. All right. But it always doesn't have to be that great. You don't have to be an 80-foot tree. Your kids don't have to be sick. E.O. Wilson, <coughs> the professor at uh, Harvard, he does this with a microscope studying ants. Right? But it comes from that, and then it leads to the other things. And that ground, grounds them in the stuff. So we're not an ism. We're not capitalism. We're not communism. We're not unionism. We don't need to argue for the complete overhaul of the world order. We just need to make it significantly more expensive to emit greenhouse gases. Oops, almost let policy sneak in, right? We're not ready for it yet. We've got to smell the earth, hunt, fish, paint, canoe, whatever it is that enables you to feel the hum of the natural world, the wild world. Our Blackberries, iPhones, libraries, nanotechnology, they're all but specks. They're good, they're useful. Right? But they're just specks in this vast, humbling sweep of geological history, including the last five ice ages that are in the more recent history, all composed of stardust, like you and me, released from an unimaginably huge original explosion. Right? Come on, that doesn't give us wonder. What would? Right? That's wonder. So I tap into this stuff all the time. I mean, just last weekend I canoed, I wanted to canoe, uh, I canoed the Potomac in Washington, right? You went from north of Georgetown in this canyon, down past the monuments, lunch at the Pentagon, right? Down past National Airport and Bowling Air Force Base where I almost got put under by giant powerboats, and then down underneath 495, the biggest, you know, most heavily trafficked bridge in the country, and down to a freshwater uh, tidal marsh, right? All that in this one area. Four different species of turtles, right? Raptors, herons, Air Force, Marine One helicopters, all right there. So 
I study storms obsessively. I'm a backcountry skier. I go to West Virginia. Um, and enjoy these things, then sharing them becomes this, this is the next most powerful experience, right? And then you see these things that you love being harmed, right? And so then something happens, right? Because what do you want to do? You want to defend them. You want to protect what you love, right? So then you need right training and skills, which is at the point, this point, I will put in a plug for a really cool program that they run at Greenpeace it's called the Greenpeace Organizing Term. It's on their website. In fact, I think they hit you with advertisements for it right when you go to greenpeace.org, right? It's doing a college semester at Greenpeace, and they train you in tactics and strategy and nonviolence and all the philosophy we use, and they put you into their campaigns. And if you do it right, you can usually get college credit for it. And it is a really cool way to spend a semester, either in D.C. or San Francisco. Um, so you need the right training, the right skills, study of tactics and strategy, study of... Sun Tzu, who wrote about strategy in a book that's interpreted as to be called The Art of War, can also be, that ideogram can also be The Art of Strategy, The Art of Tactics, it can mean a lot of things. But it's about knowing your opponent, knowing yourself, especially knowing yourself, right? Knowing the pathway. Been hearing a lot about your climate action plan here, right? And it's just an amazingly hopeful thing, right? An amazingly hopeful thing at the exact moment when we crashed and burned at the international uh, protocol, when the Senate has absolutely bulldozed over our possibilities of uh, you know, getting a price on carbon anytime <coughs> soon, we'll get it eventually, but anytime soon, you guys are working on something pretty, pretty mighty out here, right? pretty righteous. But it's going to take, obviously, more skills more knowledge, more understanding to figure out how do you keep these things alive? How do you keep weaving them through? How do you enable a bureaucracy to embrace things that it's going to be afraid of? Right? Because everybody's afraid of change. The only change we're not afraid of is the change we want. We're always afraid of everybody else's change. So, here's a quote I like. It's Hemingway. So there's some things that cannot be learned quickly, and time, which is all we have, must be paid heavily for their acquiring. They're the very simplest of things, and because it takes a man's life to know them, or a woman's life, the little new that each person gets from life is very costly, and the only heritage he has to leave. So to me, our simple yet hard-earned lesson is that we cannot root our work in hatred or anger because it drains us of power. So they teach us in school that knowledge is power, right? And I think we're just going to lose until the day we throw that canard overboard, right? Power is power, right? But our power doesn't come from a gun or from a checkbook, right? Corporations have a lot of power in our democracy because they write checks. And both Democrats and Republicans run for office and they need these checks, right? Our power originally derives from authenticity. That's why I was talking about all these things about John Muir and the tree. That begins the authenticity. John Muir in that tree, as bizarre as that is, gave him the power to talk Teddy Roosevelt into locking up huge tracts of land in America. Right? It wasn't an intellectual exercise for John Muir, nor was it, by the way, for Teddy Roosevelt, who's a complete wild man <coughs> when you get into studying the kind of trips he did. All right? Again, your trips don't need to be wild. Right? You can tap into this hum peeling garlic if you love cooking, right? Local stuff from the farmer's market. You know, I, maybe I put it maybe in too much of a guy perspective or whatever. There's ways you can tap, anybody can tap into this, but it's all about the real, wild, authentic world. 